I've been working on some isometric style scenes recently and I'm going to show you five essential tips that I stick to that will make your low poly scenes look absolutely awesome. The first tip is taking any reference material you might have and reducing it down to its simplest form. There's two aspects to that. There's the outline and then there's the details. So here's a low poly scene that I've built. If you want to learn how to make this in a methodical, easy to follow course, currently on discount at only $10, then the link's in the description. If we take the wall at the back, for example, I could just grab the outline of a wall and I could have had a big rectangular object. However, the details aspect is breaking it down into separate pieces like this, obviously adds a bit of poly count, but it's well worth it for breaking up the silhouette and making it look more realistic as it were, but still keeping to that low poly style. And in my mind, you've got three levels of detail. You've got the big shape, which is obviously the big wall shape, which is a rectangle. Then there's the medium level, which is breaking it down into these smaller pieces. But then if I zoom into my bricks, we've got separate details on those as well. So they're not all completely uniform. I've adapted them and made them individual, should we say. If we zoom out and look at the planks as another example, you can see rather than just a rectangle, I've got splits and notches in there, which make it look more like wood. And not only that, when they're joined together, if we look at the top here, you can see how there's just a little bit of variation in the gaps. So that's that medium level of detail, but it gives it that realistic feel. I'll quickly give you an example of how I would add that detail. Let's take this plank here, for example. I'll isolate the shape with forward slash on my numpad and zoom into that object and go into edit mode. You can see my edit has two loop cuts down the middle. I can add another with control R and I could rotate that and maybe press G to grab and move it off to the side just to add some distortion there. Maybe even G then Z, move it downwards. So there's a bit of a dip in the floor there. And you can see that over here. To add notches, I might come in to an edge here and press Control B for bevel, and that will create a bevel like that, as if the corner of the plank has been chipped. Another method is to just bevel a vertex. So if I go into vertex mode with one, and you can find that if I scroll across my menus at the top here with middle mouse button, you can see vertex mode there. I'll select that vertex and Control Shift B is the shortcut to bevel a vertex. And again, to add some variation to this, I can select one of the points and press GG to edge slide, and we've got a bit of variation like so. And you can see that detail that's been added there, which I think makes it look really interesting. For these longer splits and notches, I can use something like the knife tool. So that's K for knife, left click to create my cuts just across here and press enter. I can then take this vertex and bevel that, so Control Shift B, move that across. You'll notice there's a little bit of flickering in here. It doesn't like this quad being split up in this way. If I zoom in on that, it's a little bit confused as to how it's supposed to render it. I can just select these two vertices here and press J to join, and then Blender knows where the edge is meant to be. I can then take this vertex here and GG to edge slide it up, and we've got a big notch in there. And I might just add a little bit of variation like so, and we can see that detail being added here. So that's the smaller details that I've added here on this plank. And if I go back to object mode, you can see how that works nicely with the rest of the planks. You could possibly argue that these are a little bit uniform and I could maybe take this one and scale in the X. Just make sure it's overlapping over here, G then X, and give it a bit of distance there just to break that silhouette up. So that's the mid-level details. The big level is the floor itself and how it fits together in this big rectangle. The mid-level is the breaking up of the silhouette or the outline. And then the small details or the fine details are things like these notches. Now, in the example of the wall over here, as I said, we've got the big shape, which is the wall, the medium shapes, which is this break up here, and then the details, which are the details in each brick. We could go to the mid-level and refine this further. So if I select one of those bricks, zoom in on it, and I'll scale this in the Z, and duplicate it. I'll rotate it in the Z 180 degrees so it looks slightly different and scale in the Y, bring that in there and Shift D and move it out in the Y, scale in the Y. And then we've got three different separate bricks there. And you can see how we've broken up this outline even more, adding that bit of extra detail. It looks a little bit odd just on its own there. So I'd probably choose to maybe go up to the top here and do some similar adjustments in here. And I could even go in and start adapting the shape slightly just that bit more. And you can see how that mid-level changes has added that nice interest in the wall now. So as the saying goes, the devil's in the detail, but make sure you've thought about the big level details with the outline, the medium level details, 
with the individual objects and then the fine details within those objects. Another really important tip is to go and have a look at the Black Friday sale, which has already started on gamedev.tv. There's loads of amazing bundles, such as the complete advanced Blender Artist Bundle, six courses for only $30. And you'll find lots of other crazy offers, so go check them out, link in the description. The next tip is to not worry about quad-based geometry. So as I was talking about earlier with this plank here, if I go into local view and go into edit mode, you can see that I've got lots of n-gons around. You do have to be careful not to, let's say, move this vertex up in the z-axis and come up with these sort of anomalies like this because this n-gon is not planar, so flat. But when I flatten it out, so undo it, it's absolutely fine as an n-gon as it is. It makes it a little bit more tricky for adding loop cuts, let's say. So if I press Control R now, I can't add a loop cut across the middle here. So I would have to go in with the knife tool and cut it up and perhaps do a loop cut like so. And then I could maybe select this edge, G then Y, and add a little bit of variation again that way. So using the knife tool is absolutely fine. Having n-gons is fine. Having triangles is fine. It just makes it that little bit more awkward to model, that's all. But it can lead to some really interesting and good looking results. The next tip is building from the previous thinking about the levels of detail. It's the object count. How many objects you have in the scene. Now a detailed scene like this has lots of different objects, books, potion bottles and so forth. And it can be a little bit time consuming to produce those objects. It can sometimes be a little bit tempting to fill up the shelves with bigger objects so you don't have to model so much. But it's important to have big objects in your scene like this cauldron for example or the planks and the wall as well as smaller objects. And you kind of break these bigger objects up like this bookcase here with the smaller objects that go on the shelves. So finding the right balance and that often comes from looking at lots of reference images is very important to getting a well balanced good looking scene. My next super helpful tip is to use empties. I'll explain further. So if I go to object mode and select my empty that's just here on my bottle, you can see I can move this around with G to grab and it moves my entire bottle. So that's the cork, the bottle, and if my bottle has some liquid, that will also move with the empty. So if I take my cauldron, for example, which I haven't actually put an empty on, but let's say I've got all these bubbles, I've got the feet as well, and I want to move it across the floor. So G then shift Z to move those. Well, it's much easier if I can select one object and empty and just move that and have all my objects parented to it. I'll show you what that looks like. Again, I'll go to local view with forward slash on my numpad. I'll move my 3D cursor so it's roughly at the bottom there. Shift A to add and then empty. You might want to choose an empty that's similar to your object. I like the single arrow one. It sort of sticks above the object and therefore I can easily select it. So I can now select all my objects. Make sure the empty is the active object. So that's the one you select last and it's highlighted yellow and control P to parent. So I can now select my empty, press G to grab and all those objects move. Now one thing that's really helpful is to have this empty and its object origin, if I go to front view, that's the orange dot here, right at the bottom of your object. That way, if you want to use snapping, you can snap this object to the floor or any other objects around the place bookcases if you're using the bottle and so forth. In order to do that, I can't press G to grab and move it, so I'd have to select my children of the parent, so the objects within the parent, deselect are empty, and then move those into a suitable position. So I can move in here and look at where the object origin is. I'll want to indent my feet very slightly, that's often the case with low poly objects, that they overlap each other very slightly. So somewhere around there looks good. Let's go to top view and make sure it's right in the middle. There's my object origin. Let's move that to the center. And now when I come out of local view, choose my empty. Under the snapping tools, where this magnet is here, I can turn that on. Just make sure that you've got the center because that will be the object origin and I can press G to grab and you can see it's sticking to the floor now or whatever object I happen to want to put it on. So that's using empties as your controllers, should we say, for your different objects that might have separate objects within them. Another tip, and probably the most obvious, is to use lots of references. I use a program called PureRef to gather my references. The link for the program PureRef is in the description. It's pay what you like and you can put in zero dollars. And I can easily right click and drag the window onto my second monitor and easily zoom into the different references that I've gathered. These are lots of wizard workshops. 
that I've gathered together from lots of different places. You'll notice I'm not only looking at low poly, I'm looking at lots of different styles that I can reduce down into low poly. The really great thing about PureRef, if I go onto something like Pinterest, which is a great site for picking up references, and I've typed in Wizards Library, and I've got lots of great images here, I can quickly find something I like and just drag it into my PureRef, and it's easily in there for me to look at and reference. My last tip, which is more a guide than a practical tip, is to look at lots of lighting references. So you can see my scene on the right here. This is in material preview mode, so the lighting is very flat. And although it looks a relatively nice scene, if I turn off the overlays, it doesn't look as nice as the scene over here. And the main difference, obviously, is the way I've used the lighting. You can see the candles are emitting light. They're positioned in certain places to try and draw the eye and highlight certain areas. And of course, we've got the stream of light coming through the middle here, which, if I turn my overlays back on, is this box here, which has... If I go to the shading workspace, a volume scatter node with a little bit of variation added by a noise texture. And the volume scatter node is plugged into the volume, giving us that slight foggy look. And then I've got a light on the outside here that's shining through a little gap here to make sure it only shines in the window area here, just so it doesn't overlap the rest of the scene around here. Incidentally, this object is generally called a flag or a cookie. And this light here is extremely bright, 30,000 watts. It's an area light with a very small size and it creates these kind of god rays coming in here. I've got other tutorials about that and that's not necessarily the lighting you have to have, but it is important to think carefully about your lighting, experiment with different HDRIs in your scene to get the right look so it doesn't look flat and lifeless like this one and it has that warmth and interest like this one. It's difficult to go through any more of a practical example than that because the lighting will depend on your own scenes. So those are my tips for low poly modeling. If you've got any thoughts or questions, then do comment below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.